Satan of the senses. In this chapter, which is most immediately about vision, Nagarjuna really addresses the status of sense perception generally, as he makes clear in the opening and closing verses. Just as in Chapter 2, where the target positions Nagarjuna argues against a positions according to which motion and the mover inherently exist as distinct, independent, but somehow related entities. Here he argues against positions according to which the sense faculties, the sense organs, the subject of sensory experience, and the sense object inherently exist and are distinct, independent, but somehow related entities. For we do perceive motion and change. And the argument for the conventional existence of motion did suggest that it could be seen as a relation between the positions at which we perceive objects at different times. So one can imagine an opponent saying, even if the motion we perceive is not real, the perception must be. Again, it will be important for Nagarjuna that his analysis of perception as empty of inherent existence and as merely dependently arisen, does not entail its complete non-existence. He must, that is, steer a middle path between reification and nihilism using emptiness as his compass. 1. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and mind are the six sense faculties. Their spheres are the visible objects, etc. This is a standard Buddhist catalogue of the sense faculties. It differs from the standard Western catalogue only in that the Buddhists regard introspection literally as an inner sense with the same epistemic structure as outer senses and presumably subserved by analogous physical structures. Nagarjuna will not dispute the reality of these faculties or of their respective spheres. But he will insist that that reality must be characterized interdependently and conventionally. Two that very seeing does not see itself at all. How can something that cannot see itself see another? This cryptic argument is aimed at any theory according to which vision is inherently existent. The idea is this. If the visual faculty were to be inherently existent, then seeing would be its essence. Its action would hence require no distinct conditions and no external object to be seen. That is, if vision were inherently existent, vision would occur simply in virtue of the existence of the visual faculty. Suppose then that there is an inherently existent visual faculty and no external sense object for it. It would then have only itself as a possible object of sight, yet it would be seeing and so would have to be seeing itself. Therefore, Nagarjuna argues, a view of vision as inherently existent would entail the possibility of visual apperception. But there is no such possibility. So the fact that vision can see other things cannot be in virtue of its containing percipience as an inherent property. There is also a plausible Pyrrhonian interpretation of this verse. The point of a sensory faculty is to make knowledge possible. But that is only possible if the data the faculty provides are themselves perceived. But the data that the visual faculty delivers are visual. If they themselves are to be perceived, one would require either another visual faculty, hence generating a vicious regress, or apperception by vision, which is absurd. The point is not then that vision is impossible but rather that visual perception or any kind of perception can only be completely explained and characterized by reference to things outside of the visual faculty itself. Vision is relational, and not an intrinsically identifiable phenomenon. 3. The example of fire cannot elucidate seeing. Along with the moved and not moved and motion that has been answered. This is a reply to a standard substantialist counterexample to a Madhyamika analysis, specifically. Fire burns other things, but does not burn itself. And it can be intrinsically identified. Perhaps then vision is like fire, in that it can see others but not itself, while it does not need to be relationally identified. This example is a standard in early Buddhist debates. 
about intrinsic versus relational identity, and Nagarjuna devotes an entire chapter to its refutation as a dialectical device. Chapter 10. Arguing there that fire cannot be intrinsically identified. But at this point, he is willing to grant the opponent that premise for the sake of argument. For, he claims, its utility as an analogy has already been undermined by the argument in the second chapter. How? Whatever fire is burning must be burned in the past, the future, or the present. But, as with motion, burning cannot be, by its very nature, in the past, on pain of regress. Nor can it be in the future for the same reason. But burning cannot take place in the present either, for there is not enough time in an instant for anything to burn. Mutatis mutandis for vision. In the case of vision, for Nagarjuna, there is a further problem with vision of another in the present. A visual process and any sensory process takes time. So if vision is seeing another thing, the other thing is already past. The only thing that vision could see in the present is a visual sense impression. But then we are back to the problem of visual apperception. So even if fire were intrinsically identifiable, there is no point at which it could burn another. And if vision were intrinsically identifiable, there would be no moment at which it could see another. 4. When there is not even the slightest non-seeing seer. How could it make sense to say that seeing sees? When all there is to vision is visual perception. What is the motivation for positing an entity to undertake the process of perception? All there is to vision is the perceptual process. We don't need to posit an entity the visual faculty over and above the set of interdependent phenomena that subserve vision. The desire to do so is of a piece with the more general substantialist imperative to posit an independent substratum to support every capacity or property. 5. Seeing itself does not see. Non-seeing itself does not see. Through seeing itself, the clear analysis of the seer is understood. Perception is not accomplished by any independent entity known as vision. But that doesn't mean that things that are incapable of sight thereby perceive. In order to know what the proper subject of vision is, it is important to undertake a careful analysis of the perceptual process and not simply to posit a faculty with the nature of vision. 6. Without detachment from vision there is no seer. Nor is there a seer detached from it. If there is no seer, how can there be seeing or the seen? On Nagarjuna's analysis, we can't make sense of an autonomous subject of visual perception. For such a subject would by definition have its identity as a visual subject independent of perception. But there is no sense in calling something that does not see a seer. On the other hand, if we pack vision into its definition, we thereby fail to identify the subject non-relationally. Vision and its subject are thus relational, dependent phenomena and not substantial or independent entities. So neither seeing nor seer nor the seen, conceived of as the object of sense perception, can be posited as entities with inherent existence. The point is just that sense perception cannot be understood as an autonomous phenomenon, but only as a dependent process. 7. Just as the birth of a son is said to occur in dependence on the mother and father, so consciousness is said to arise in dependence on the eye and material form. Here the opponent offers yet another argument in favor of the inherent existence of the visual faculty and, by extension, the other sense faculties. Colon. Consciousness is a consequence of vision, and it surely exists in fact, its existence, one might say, is self-validating. Given the reality of the effect, the cause must also be real. The final two verses reply to this objection and state the obvious generalization to all other senses, sense objects, sense faculties, and faculties of knowledge. The reply consists in pointing out that the other faculties and aggregates 
including introspection and consciousness, exist and fail to exist in exactly the senses that vision and its objects exist and fail to exist. All are empty of inherent independent existence. But all exist conventionally. So the effect that, according to this interlocutor, exists inherently and demands an inherently existent cause does not so exist. And in the sense that it exists, its causes also exist. 8. From the non-existence of seeing and the seen it follows that the other four faculties of knowledge do not exist. And all the aggregates, etc. are the same way. 9. Like the seen, the heard, the smell, the tasted, and the touched. The hearer, sound, etc. Comma. And consciousness should be understood. Again, the point of this chapter is emphatically not that there is no perception, or that there are no sense faculties, sense organs, or sense objects. Rather the point is that none of these can be analyzed successfully as autonomous entities. They are interdependent phenomena that depend for their existence and their character on each other. None of them exists independently. They are all. Hence. Empty of inherent existence. And carving the process of perception into these components represents a conventional taxonomy of a process that does not present itself with natural joints demanding cleavage on their own.